There are very good reasons why we have different styles and types of control valves. With each of the valve styles, there are multiple variations. The goal is to select the proper product to reliably satisfy the application requirements. In order to select that product, we need to have an easily understood method for doing this that can be easily applied and get consistent results. Just because I have a flow coefficient doesn't mean I'm going to successfully select the best control valve. So what other considerations need to be taken into account? Life cycle considerations such as initial capital expense versus installed equipment life expectancy should be taken into account. If you have an installation that's expected to last for the duration of your process, you should consider spending more money to get the set it and forget it type of control valve. However, if it's a short term installation that's only going to be around for a couple of months, you may consider a more economical option. Maintenance schedule. Are there going to be routine shutdowns and if so, what are the frequencies? The location of the valve needs to be considered too. Is the valve close to the ground where it's easily accessible? Or is it up on a scaffold where you have to rent a crane in order to remove it for maintenance? And then, how much does it cost to maintain? The downtime that is incurred when a valve is out of service is lost revenue. Also, look at the valve's impact on a process, its availability and reliability. How close to set point does that control valve need to operate? Is 10% acceptable, or does it need to be 1% or even half a percent accurate? You also need to consider code requirements, such as B16.34 and any industry-specific regulations. There are material requirements, such as NACE or ISO, for corrosion resistance, and then there also may be specific application site and project requirements that also need to be taken into consideration. Other things to keep in mind are no two applications are identical. Even a company that has multiple facilities that are, quote, exactly the same, or just one facility with duplicate trains, no two processes are completely identical. There's going to be something different. Maybe the piping is slightly skewed. Maybe you have fluctuations in temperature and pressure. Even though one valve installation is successful, that success may not be duplicated in an identical train. All these things need to be considered and, unfortunately, the desires of the engineering piping contractor and the end user will sometimes be contradictory. What happens if you don't select the ideal control valve assembly? This first picture you can see the set point and you can watch the valve trying to operate at the same point, but it is jumping all over the place. Poor control can lead to wasted feedstock as well as off-spec product. Also. If you don't consider all the metallurgical aspects that are going on inside that valve, you can have stress corrosion cracking and trim failures that are unexpected. In the final example, we have a globe valve with what appears to be a trim inspection hole. However, that's not the case. This void is actually the result of a corrosion coupled with erosion that occurred from flow acceleration. You had a fluid going through a carbon steel control valve that was impinging upon the inside of the valve body. Rust that formed inside the valve body and was continuously getting wiped away and eventually created a hole in the wall. Needless to say, control valve performance is a critical factor in achieving operational excellence. Visit Fisher.com or contact your local Emerson sales office to learn more. Emerson uses international standards as the basis for all our control valve designs. In order to properly size and select a control valve, we need to understand what those standards are and how they are used. Why do we use international standards? The reason we use international standards is because they're proven, easily accessible, formal, and they help eliminate bias. They level the playing field. ASME B1634 is the control valve design code that Emerson uses as the basis for Fisher control valve designs. B1634 covers material pressure temperature ratings, dimensions, tolerances, and more. Control valve face-to-face -face dimensions are governed by ASME B16.10. This standard helps ensure consistency in process piping.
A control valve's primary function is to accurately control the process media flowing through it, whereas an isolation or shutoff valve's primary function is to stop the process flow completely and prevent it from going further downstream. Because their purposes differ, they are often not held to the same design or performance standards. A control valve's allowable acceptable leakage rate is specified by ANSI slash FCI 70.2 and IEC 60534-4. ISA 75.0101 and IEC 60534-2-1 are international standards for the sizing equations and sizing models that are used to calculate the control valve CV. Although it is not currently a standard, recommended practice ISA RP 75.23 is used to evaluate the potential for cavitation in liquid process flows. If overlooked, cavitation has the potential to cause high levels of noise and serious damage to piping and equipment. Then, finally, Aerodynamic Noise Prediction ISA 7515 and IEC 60534-8-3 is another good standard to review during valve sizing. Visit Fisher.com or contact your local Emerson sales office to learn more. In this video, we'll go through a step-by-step -step process for sizing control valves for compressible fluid using the ISA and IEC's recommended procedure. For this example, we'll assume superheated steam is to be supplied to a process designed to operate at 250 PSIG or 17.2 bar. The supply source is a header maintained at 500 PSIG or 34.5 bar and 500 degrees Fahrenheit or 260 degrees Celsius. An NPS6 or DN150 standard schedule line from the steam main to the process is being planned. Note that a 6-inch standard schedule pipe has an inside diameter of 6.1 inches. Also, make the assumption that if the required valve size is less than NPS6 or DN150, it will be installed using concentric reducers. Now let's go through the process to determine the appropriate Fisher ED valve with a linear cage. The first step is to specify the variables required to size the valve. The desired valve design is a Class 300 globe valve with an assumed size of 4 inches and a linear cage. The other service conditions are shown. We'll keep these conditions on screen throughout for reference. Start by trying an NPS4 or DN100 Fisher ED valve with linear trim at 100% travel, where CV equals 236 and X sub T equals 0 0.69. For step 2, determine the equation constants N sub 2, N sub 5, and N sub 6, N sub 8 or N sub 9. From the equation constants table in the control valve handbook, we can see that N sub 2 equals 890 and N sub 5 equals 1000. When mass flow rate is given in pounds per hour and density is given in pound mass per cubic foot, use N sub 6, which equals 63.3. In step 3, determine the piping geometry factor, or F sub P, and the pressure drop ratio factor, or X sub TP, adjusted for the attached fittings. First, find the necessary resistance coefficients needed when the upstream and downstream pipe sizes are the same. Use the standard K sub 1 equation. Plug in your variables for a result of 0 0.16. Now use the standard K sub B1 equation and insert your variables for a result of 0 0.82 and use the standard sigma k equation and apply the variables for a result of 0 0.49. Now let's calculate the piping geometry factor, or F sub p. Use the standard F sub p equation, plug in your variables for a resulting F sub p value of 0 0.945. For the last part of step 3, calculate the pressure drop ratio factor, or X sub tp. Use the standard X sub TP equation and insert the variables for a calculation of 0 0.67. Step 4. Determine the pressure drop ratio to use for sizing, or X sub sizing, and the expansion factor Y. Start by calculating the ratio of specific heats factor, F sub gamma. 
use the standard F sub gamma equation, apply the gamma value of 1.33 for a value of 0.95. Use this result to find the choked pressure drop ratio. Use the standard equation, plug in the variables for a result of 0.64. The choked flow pressure drop ratio is greater than the actual pressure drop ratio, so X subsizing equals X, which equals 0.49. Then plug in the variables to find the expansion factor, y, for a result of 0.75. Finally, for step 5, calculate the required flow coefficient, or CV. Use the standard equation for CV and apply the variables for a value of 173. Repeat the calculation using the published x sub t values for the valve until agreement is obtained between CV and x sub t. This results in a required CV of 169 and x sub t value of 0.754. This occurs at about 66% open, so the NPS4, DN100, Fisher ED valve with linear trim would be an acceptable solution with respect to capacity. The next smaller size of ED valve with linear trim has a rated CV of only 148, so it would not be an appropriate valve for this situation. So that's the process for sizing a valve for compressible fluid. Visit Fisher.com or contact your local Emerson sales office for more information. In this video, we'll go through a step-by-step -step process for sizing control valves for liquid flow using the ISA and IEC procedure and apply each step to an example valve. Let's go through how to verify the appropriate valve size. Step 1. Specify the variables required to size the valve. The desired valve design is a class 300 globe valve with an assumed size of 3 inches and an equal percentage cage. We'll assume standard concentric reducers will be used to install the valve into the line. This valve has a 100% open flow coefficient, or CV, of 121 with a liquid pressure recovery factor, or F sub L, of 0.89. The process fluid is liquid propane and the service conditions are shown. We'll keep these conditions on screen throughout for reference. Step 2. Determine the equation constants, N1 and N2. From the equation constants table in the control valve handbook, N1 equals 1.0 and N2 equals 890. Step 3. Determine the piping geometry factor, or F sub P, and the liquid pressure recovery factor, or F sub LP, adjusted for the attached fittings. First, find the necessary resistance coefficients needed when the upstream and downstream pipe sizes are the same. Use the K1 equation and plug in your variables for a result of 0.37. Now use the KB1 equation and enter your variables for a result of 0.98 and use the sigma k equation and insert the variables for a result of 1.11. Next, let's calculate the piping geometry factor or F sub p. Use the standard F sub p equation and plug in your variables for a resulting F sub p of 0.90. Then, calculate the liquid pressure recovery factor, or F sub LP. Use the equation and insert your variables to find that F sub LP equals 0.81. Step 4. Determine the pressure drop to use for sizing, or delta P sizing. When the difference between the upstream and downstream pressure is high enough, the liquid may start to vaporize, causing choked flow. If the actual pressure drop across the valve, delta P, is higher than the pressure drop that causes choked flow, the choked flow pressure drop, delta P choked, must be used in place of the actual pressure drop. First, find the liquid critical pressure ratio factor. Use the F sub F equation. Plug in your variables for a result of 0.83. 
The choked pressure drop, delta P sizing, is found using the standard delta P choked equation. Enter your variables for a result of 171 PSI. Since the actual pressure drop is lower than the choked pressure drop, we know that delta P sizing equals delta P, which equals 25 PSI. Finally, for step 5, calculate the required flow coefficient, or CV. Use the standard equation for CV. Plug in the variables for a result of 125.7. The required CV of 125.7 exceeds the capacity of the assumed valve, which has a CV of 121. For this example, it may be obvious that the next larger size valve with a 4-inch nominal pipe size, or NPS4, would be the correct valve size. This may not always be true and a repeat of the previous steps should be carried out. Now let's assume it's an NPS4 valve with a CV of 203 and an F sub L of 0.91. These values were determined from the flow coefficient table for a class 300 NPS4 Fisher ES globe valve with an equal percentage cage. Recalculate the F sub P in step 3 using an assumed CV value of 203. First, find a new sigma k value using the equation. Plug in your variables for a new sigma k value of 0.84. Now recalculate F sub p using this new sigma k value for a new F sub p value of 0.93. Enter this value back into the CV equation from step 5 for a new CV of 121.7. This solution indicates only that the NPS4 valve is large enough to satisfy the service conditions given. There may be cases where a more accurate prediction of the CV is required. In such cases, the required CV should be redetermined using a new F sub P value based on this new CV. In this example, CV is 121.7. When we insert that into the equation, we get a new F sub P of 0.97. Now plug this F sub P value into the CV equation for a final CV of 116.6. Because this newly determined CV is very close to the CV used initially for this recalculation, 116.6 versus 121.7, the valve sizing procedure is complete. The conclusion is that an NPS4 valve opened to about 75% of total travel should be adequate for the required specifications. So that's the process for sizing a valve for liquid flow. Visit Fisher.com or contact your local Emerson sales office for more information.